Tommy, really appreciate uh, you taking the time and, and great to connect again. Yes, yeah, uh, great to be back. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, I didn't mean for it to be so long. If people are just tuning in, the season one, I think episode 15 or 16, we had Tommy on talking all about the athlete gut, you know, really fascinating stuff. A great place to start, Tommy, is, is to give us an update on what you're doing these days in terms of research and, and practice. Sure. So, so it has been a, a, a few years since whatever it was that I said about myself back then. <laughs> yeah. uh, but since then, I've become a, a full-time faculty, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington. Uh, my main work is running neuroscience lab where we look at ways to treat the injured brain. And we do a whole range of brain injuries. So neonatal and pediatric brain injuries, that's arena where I did my PhD. Uh, but we also do some work in traumatic brain injury uh, with some uh, some work funded by, by the military. And then I'm um, increasingly interested in how pretty much the entire uh, life course then affects long-term cognitive function. So what we've learned recently is that basically there's this trajectory of your brain health across the entire lifespan that starts right when you're born or maybe even before you're born. And then all these things happen over time that can then affect the long-term outcome, long-term cognitive function, risk of dementia. And what's good, we think, is that there are lots of modifiable things that we can do, right? It's not this like fixed risk that we have to then just be stressed about because there's nothing we could do about it. There's, there's a lot that we can do about it. And so that's really where my focus has been is trying to figure out ways to keep your brain healthy and happy and functional for your entire life. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing area and, you know, excited to dig into the paper that you've just written because, you know, as you know, massive investment in, in cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's disease over the last decade or two. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of uh, findings and around mechanisms and whatnot, but not a lot of progress as it relates to to the patient and the outcome yeah. and so you know the paper here demand coupling drives neurodegeneration a model of age-related de cognitive decline and dementia so can you frame things for listeners to get us started you know why this new proposed model sure so as you kind of uh, intimated and as um, you know people who are interested in dementia or alzheimer's disease probably know uh, is that we've spent decades at this point focusing on one specific area or therapeutic target which is amyloid um, or amyloid plaques so uh, amyloid uh, is a protein in the brain um, it comes from a precursor that can be chopped up in lots of different ways depending on the the downstream function that your brain wants but what essentially happens is that in, in people with advanced dementia or in other types of brain injury so you might see it after a traumatic brain injury you get this misfolding and accumulation of this uh, amyloid protein and then it becomes something we call a plaque and you can kind of see it the reason why we focus on this is because you can see it on a on a slide of yeah. the brain so some the person dies you chop up their brain you look at it under a microscope and you can see you can see these uh, proteins and when alzheimer's was originally described by dr alois alzheimer it was a dementing process happening early in life uh, and there's one particular patient who was the first patient uh, and what we think now, uh, although there's still some discussion about it, as there is for most things, what we think now is that the patients he was describing and were then described in the first case reports were due to familial or monogenic or early onset Alzheimer's disease. So one gene that gets mutated and then you, you essentially get Alzheimer's disease or dementia in your 30s and 50s is kind of this very sort of relatively quick, uh, rapid, rapid yeah. uh, decline and in cognitive function. And it's a very sort of homogeneous process. However, what most people are concerned about is not that, it's what we now call late onset or sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which is more than 95% of Alzheimer's disease. And that has a whole bunch of different things that, that might be involved. So if there's any genetic component, it's polygenic uh, and, and complex. You know, there are some genes that people focus on a lot, like APOE4 or your apolipoprotein E genotype, which we can talk about if you want. Uh, but then lifestyle is important. And people have a really struggled to kind of fit together all these potential risk factors. Nutrient status is important. Uh, toxic exposure like uh, pollution expo is, is important. Metals, yeah. Stress is important. Sleep. So like all these things uh, are important there. And it's very heterogeneous. So um, there's this uh, 
phrase that people say is that once you've seen one patient with Alzheimer's disease, you've seen one patient with Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> yeah, for sure. With, with it's complex, you, multifactorial, yeah. what is actually going on? If we exactly. could pause quickly, uh, Tommy, yeah. and pin it with that APOE, can you go mm -hmm. down that road a little bit? Because that's definitely one with the rise of getting people's genetic tests run from a nutrition standpoint. This is often the one that clients will have run. And then as they come into a practitioner's office or a doctor's office, this is a conversation starter around, am I at greater risk? What does all this mean? And I think there's a lot of confusion around that. Yeah, it's a great point because it's something that we've become very focused on, even though I'm not sure how helpful it is <laughs> for, for a few reasons. Good way to sum it up. <laughs> so in uh, modern westernized populations where, where we've done these studies, so the US or you know, the UK or, or parts of Europe, you see that people who have either one or two copies of ApoE4. So there are three different genotypes for this uh, SNP. It's two, three, and four. And you can, and you obviously have two copies, right? So you can have one or two copies of four or one or two copies of uh, two or three and some combination of them. Mm -hmm. And if you have one or two copies of ApoE4, your odds, odds, which is the probability divided by one minus the probability, which is difficult for people to get their head around unless they bet on sports because everything is-, is <laughs> Then it's is, dialed in. <laughs> Yeah, that is started. They know exactly what you mean. But the odds of Alzheimer's disease are increased maybe six to 20 fold, depending, you know, if you have ApoE4 in that population. However, this is what's said commonly that not everybody with ApoE4 gets Alzheimer's disease. And most people who get Alzheimer's disease don't have ApoE4, right? So it's not this definite mm -hmm. significant risk factor. It just increases the probability or odds. And what's interesting is that there seems to be a gene environment interaction that we don't understand fully. But when you look at non-Westernized populations, so uh, Central African populations, Central American populations, indigenous American populations, ApoE4 is not a risk factor for cognitive decline. Interesting. So there's there in my mind, that means that there's something about having, having ApoE4 and being put in the modern environment, which includes generally disordered sleep, um, lack of movement, poor quality diet, right? Mm. Uh, air pollution, right? A whole bunch of things. So, so it may um, accelerate your negative responses to that environment. And it's because in the brain after an injury or with these sort of chronic exposures, it seems to enhance the inflammatory response. It's sort of intimately tied into the immune function as well as uh, lipid metabolism. So it is a risk factor and it, you know, in those populations, it's thought to contribute maybe four to 6% of your total risk. Okay. However, certainly not um, something that's definite and is probably driven by the environment and the environment we can modify. Um, and I can't tell you exactly what it is in the environment that you have to modify, but obviously those things, you know, people who listen to this podcast, they probably uh, move more than your average person. They probably think about their sleep more than the average person, right? They think about their diet. So, so I think most of that stuff is being is being modified uh, in a beneficial way. Another thing that's important is that when you tell people about their genotype in general, it doesn't change their behavior, but it <laughs> can increase their stress. Mm -hmm. So what so what happens is so if, if at the population level you were testing everybody for APOE4, most people won't do anything about it, like they won't modify their environment or their lifestyle. But they will get stressed about the fact that there are increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And we know that chronic stress is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. So you've almost created a problem that, that nobody's going to fix. Uh, um, other than if there are very, there's a very small percent of the population who are sort of very goal oriented type A and you like, you have this, you do this to fix it. And they're like, great, I'll do it. No problem. But sure. that's not most people. I'm thinking two things there. I mean, one of them, when we think about Obviously, you mentioned the athletes, the performance staff and the coaches, obviously older, 40s, 50s, 60 beyond. And oftentimes, you know, their movement and nutrition, ironically, being in that environment isn't what we would <laughs> like it to be. And so I think there's yeah. hopefully a good chance to nudge uh, some behaviors there. And yeah, I mean, yeah, you're still right in the sense of tests, even when we look at athletes of what we're testing and what the implications then can be, particularly on the genetic level of then feeding into this sort of worry, whether it's glucose monitors or, or whatnot, that then start to actually trigger a problem that we didn't actually have in the first place. 
Yeah, exactly. There's more evidence for a nocebo effect mm -hmm. from genetic testing than there is for any benefit uh, in terms of people modifying th their behavior. Uh, so you have to be very, very specific about what information you're giving and who you're giving it to and whether they'll actually act upon it in the right way. Yeah, that's great advice. And if we think about some other observations from whether it's an evolutionary lens or population level, you know, what are some other aspects that have really you know, contributed to this demand-driven model for age-related cognitive decline? Sure. So where we kind of ended up uh, with, with this paper uh, was, so I, so I mentioned all those things that may be important for late onset Alzheimer's disease. And the the fact that, you know, we've we focused really at the, like the, the pathological level, like what can you see in the brain of somebody who has Alzheimer's disease? And we mentioned amyloid. There's another protein that we're increasingly interested in uh, called tau, which becomes phosphorylated and creates what we call neurofibrillary tangles. So again, this is just a different type of protein aggregation uh, in the brain. And when you have a bunch of amyloid and a bunch of tau uh, tangles, they can cause damage mm -hmm. to, to the neurons. Like that. But that's like at the advanced stage. Up until that point, the amount of protein, these proteins you have in your brain doesn't really correlate with your symptoms, doesn't really correlate with your disease progression. And when we've developed drugs or monoclonal antibodies to target something like an amyloid plaque, we can reduce the number of plaques in your brain, but it doesn't make any difference to your long-term outcomes. Wow. And that's a big statement too, right? Because that's right. been the folk, the area of focus for the last decade, two decades. And yeah. it's, uh, you know, in terms of yielding outcomes, it is amazing that it's not actually providing that benefit. And, you know, I have to say that maybe just it wasn't the right drugs and may maybe I'm wrong and the next one <laughs> will work, right? That's that's always, a, you know, that's always a possibility. Um, but we essentially argue in the paper that those two types of Alzheimer's disease shouldn't come under the same umbrella term, right? We shouldn't mm -hmm. call them a Alzheimer's disease anymore because the one is like very specific and the other is just so heterogeneous and different that we probably need a different way of thinking about it. And so we called it age-related cognitive decline and then age-related dementia, just to kind of separate it out. And then we sort of put together the, the, the sets of evidence, which are like molecular and societal and you know, even randomized controlled trials to basically suggest that the most important thing for long-term cognitive function is cognitive demand. Like how much are you challenging your brain? And I mean this in the way that it's not, you know, we all think that we're challenging our brain all day, right? We're super busy. We're super stressed. Mm -hmm. That's not the same thing. I'm, I'm talking like specific skill development, things you can work on for like 20 or 30 minutes. And like, that's it. You're like pushing the boundaries of your skill and, and learning. That's the kind of stuff that we do when we develop our brains in the first place, right? That's how babies learn motor skills, social skills, language skills. And those are the things that we just stop doing uh, as we get older. But to kind of make people, I think, understand it a little bit better, we liken it to exercise. Mm -hmm. So imagine uh, you lead the per like a pristine lifestyle, no pollution, um, perfect diet, some mass unless you apply me mechanical tension to your muscles, right? For like sure. mechanical tension is, is, is king if you're trying to get bigger and stronger. And I think the same thing is said of the brain. You can put the brain in the perfect environment, but if you don't ask it to do anything, it won't develop connections. It won't develop resilience. It won't be plastic and a bit and and be able to respond. And there's a whole bunch of evidence that says that you know the best way to develop these connections, to develop the brain, to make it stronger, more resilient, is to challenge it. And in uh, rodents, you can do that by changing the their environment and this will work even if even in the setting of uh, other toxins or other other problems right you still just like if you haven't optimized your diet and sleep you'll still get stronger if you go to the gym yeah. right you could improve the response by improving nutrient status and sleep and recovery but the thing that really matters is challenge um and then in humans we see i guess resilience or reduced risk of um a cognitive decline uh in people who are bilingual in people who do particularly coordinative movement, so movement that has uh, like a balance component, probably because of the extra cognitive demand. Things like Tai Chi or... Tai Chi, yoga, um, you know, 
I'm sure board sports and other things, slacklining, right? Nobody's done a study on that, but the the, the principles. If you don't fall too much, you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, as long as you don't hit your head when you when you fall over. Um, and then the the sort of I guess the the best evidence that that I really have for it, at sort of a, a large population level, is that in multiple population studies, the earlier you retire, the earlier you suffer from cognitive decline. And that's probably because, again, in modern westernized populations, most of your cognitive demand comes from your daily work. Yeah. Um, and so as soon as you remove that, you know, most people don't retire and then go and travel and learn a language and take up yoga. They sit at home and watch TV and then occasionally do a Sudoku because they think that that's <laughs> going to be enough to challenge, challenge their brain. So basically from sort of the mechanistic uh, level all the way up to the societal level, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that really the most important thing is how much you challenge your brain. And there's all the other things matter, right? Just like, you know, we'll go back to exercise because I think that that helps people really think about it. Mm -hmm. um, we know that if you're sleep deprived, you won't gain as much um, muscle and strength in, in response to a, a specific training program, right? And the, the brain is the same. We know sleep is critical for plasticity and consolidation and also for long-term cognitive uh, health as is nutrient status and avoiding significant stresses and hormonal status. And all that stuff is incredibly important, but the primary driver really seems to be cognitive demand. And that's kind of what we've outlined uh, or proposed in the paper. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And if we start on the, the music side of things, you know, with music, if you are someone who is more proficient or say a professional musician as you get older versus let's say I want to start playing piano at 40, 50, 60, in terms of cognitive demand, is that going to be the same? Or you would think that perhaps the, the, the newbie would have to be obviously higher cognitive demand to actually learn some of those new skills? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And there's actually a, a study that does partially answer this question. A number of studies have used an MRI scan followed by this machine learning algorithm that's called brain age. So basically, you do a scan of your brain, and then you feed it to this algorithm, and you say, how old does this brain look? Okay. Right, it's had a whole, you know, thousands of like training scans. Yeah. And then you can look at the difference between how old your brain looks versus how old you are chronologically, right? And they did a study with musicians and they looked at their brain age relative to their, you know, actual age in years. And all musicians had a lower brain age than their actual age in years. Wow. But amateur musicians had an even younger brain compared to <laughs> looking brain compared wow. to professional musicians. And the thought was that this is because it's harder for an amateur, right? Once you're a professional, once you've learned a skill, it's no longer a challenge. Uh, so uh, amateur musicians are worse at music, but because they do it, they're getting more of a challenge. And that seems to be reflected in, in then how their brain looks on a brain scan. And I imagine then the crossover to language would be similar then. Obviously, someone learning yeah. Spanish at 40, 50, 60 versus someone who's already bilingual, there could be a similar benefit there for them as well. Yeah, the, I don't think they've looked at it in the same way, but there are there are a number of strands around language. So people who grow up bilingual and then continue to use both languages seem to have you know, protection of the various tracts in the brain that are associated with you know long-term long function. Um, and I think... You know, all the evidence kind of suggests that while there is some specificity in the challenge that you apply, uh, say like memory skills versus motor skills versus language skills are going to affect, you know, different parts of the brain. Yep. It seems like this sort of translates across skills as well. So what happens in musicians in amateurs versus professionals, you know, should translate to people picking up a language later in life you know, versus somebody who's been bilingual all their life. And then that second language isn't as much uh, of a challenge. Um, but what then comes up when I talk about this is people are like, well, my brain is old. I just can't learn new things. <laughs> um, and this is, this is, you're right. It is a good excuse. Um, but this is this like story that we've been told for which there yeah. isn't that much evidence. Like there are, there are, there are a sample some... of the genetics before where you tell people yeah. that a thing is a thing or that you run slow and all of a sudden it, it manifests yeah. itself. Yeah, exactly. So one of the ways that we, we know that the adult brain is plastic and by plastic, I mean that it, it adapts and can change to, to its environment. It's not this fixed thing that we just like lose cells over time, which is kind of what we've been told. But they've done these studies uh, where they... Um, and they've done them in animals as well, but they have done them in humans where you attach prism glasses 
uh, to the person or they put um, glasses on that have a prism in. So it shifts yeah. where the light comes in. So okay. you no longer understand where you are in physical space. Oof. And in, in so like they've done a, the, one of the original studies, they started in Berkeley in the late 1890s. Um, and then oh. sort of like there were more done later in, in Innsbruck. But if you put uh, glasses on somebody, an, an adult, and it completely flips upside down, right? So everything is upside down. Within six days, they're able to interact with the environment completely normally. So you've completely Incredible. changed the map of, of your body and physical space in your brain within a few days. And then they can, they've done shorter term prism experiments where you put these prism glasses on and then you have to like have people throw balls at a target. And older people, sort of like in their 60s and 70s, it takes them a few more tries to get it right. But within like a, a reasonable time course, you know, it just it's just like a few more minutes, they're still adapting just like a younger person would. Mm -hmm. So even though some of the processes may be a little bit slower when you're older, your brain is still completely able to adapt to these challenges. So I would reject this idea that your brain is this fixed thing and you're older, it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. You just you're and, stuck. And I would right, and it's stuck. And instead I'd say, well, it's probably feels like it's stuck because you just haven't been using it you're a little um, stuck <laughs> but, yeah ex exactly and just you know I, I think there's there's something to be said for acknowledging that actually my brain can do amazing things i just have to make sure that i ask it to do those things and then you will adapt over time and following that you know there's obviously been a lot of apps and things in the last decade around brain training hmm. you know, puzzles various things are those actually going to elicit some of the increase in demand that you're looking for or only specific you know, forms of, of that type of strategy? I think it will probably depend on the degree of, of difficulty. There are some brain training systems. So the one that has the best evidence is called Brain HQ okay. by Posit Neuroscience. Um, and this is one that uh, if people have heard of Dale Bredesen, he's, he's mm -hmm. developed these really quite impressive protocols for people with cognitive impairment to try and reverse some of those processes. And one of the things that he uses is brain HQ because it's sort of, it's on a computer, it's um, systematized. You can sort of track progress over time. Whereas learning a language is kind of a, a slightly more nebulous thing, right? Yeah, you, progress isn't linear. Hard. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, and so, and brain HQ does have some evidence to say that if you do that, even though it's sort of abstract games and tests and things, it has some like carryover to real world executive function and, and, and memory and function as well. So some of these, yeah, cool. these training modalities do seem to work. Um, and I, I recently had somebody ask me about video games. Um, and, and I don't think, I don't think video games have been tested in such a rigorous way, but if you think about fine motor skills, reaction time, spatial memory, um, problem solving. Yeah. There's there's a whole bunch of stuff that can come from video games, and now I'm just like justifying my love of Zelda. <laughs> yeah, maybe I was say, a bit of bias there, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so I think some of these things re really can be beneficial. Um, there is a possibility, and uh, you know, it really is just a possibility that you know our brain sort of adapted to be really good at certain functions. So we talked about motor skills, social skills, language skills, and I think that there's something inherently human about those skills. So you, there may be additional benefits from doing that. You know, we know there's additional benefits from doing things in a, in a social yeah. setting. So maybe you're learning a language in a group and you're, you're getting multiple benefits there. Um, so, so lots of different things can, can provide this challenge. And I think that's what's good. People can do what, what they like, but there may be a possibility that, you know, part of a group setting or some of these more sort of like core human uh, skills and activities may provide additional benefit, but that's sort of hypothetical. I definitely want to come back to the social connection part, but before we do that, let's go circle back to the exercise because a lot of people will be interested in, you know, how much exercise, obviously of a very athletic population listening in, is it like yeah. more jacked, more fit, the progression <laughs> keeps going. And for the coaches listening in, there's sort of the minimum effective dose group. It's like, okay, what, what's the least I need to do to get, start getting some significant benefits to the brain? Yeah, the, 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 that's a great question. Um, and there have been a few sort of large meta-analyses, meta-aggressions that have looked at this recently, specifically with relation to cognitive decline. And it, it seems like basically the, the standard government guidelines of 30 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity, that's probably your minimum effective dose. Okay. So like a 30-minute brisk walk 
is is where is is probably enough to start seeing benefits. So so probably not that much, right? Something that's eminently doable by most people. And again, it it may not matter that much whether it's walking or lifting weights, right? It, it's when they sort of put them together, it seems like they're having an equivalent effect. Okay. Obviously, there's uh, you you might get some you know so if you're doing resistance training, you might get slightly different like neuromuscular benefits based on those connections. And they've done studies the the smart trial, which which was in um, individuals in their seventies, and they had them do either a resistance training program or a cognitive training program or both. And they saw significant benefits with the resistance training group in particular, uh, but the cognitive training added benefits in like the memory centers in the brain and in the hippocampus. So there is, like I said, there is some specificity, but like even lifting weights uh, is enough to do that. And they did, it was like three times a week, uh, six exercises, three sets of eight, like something okay, super, pretty, super pretty basic, right? Yeah, yeah, n- n- nothing, nothing heroic. Um, like I said earlier, there is some evidence to suggest that coordinative movement is 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 better. Um, and so they've done studies where they compared a similar intensity of exercise, but they did like circuit training versus dancing. Mm-hmm. And the dancing was associated with more improvements in certain areas of the brain, probably because it's a coordination component. Yeah, I guess your brain trying to orient yourself in space, it's got to yeah. be a survival element to yeah, that yeah, to be exa- able to exactly. actually do and maintain and, and be proficient, no? Yeah, that, that's exactly how I think about it, is that your sort of orientation in space is is like this existential thing that's required for survival. So yeah. that's more of a, your, your brain is going to work harder to figure that out rather than, you know, just doing some bench press. So I'm a big fan of bench press, but- um, Exactly. Well, that's you know. a, a funny thing to wrap your head around, isn't it? Because <laughs> the level of effort that someone would prescribe to a bench press versus a dance would be very different to yeah. what, you know, what you're suggesting here. Obviously, from a cognitive standpoint, we're getting almost the opposite effect. Um, now the conversation on exercise tends to lead down to things like blood sugar control, Mm. obviously in the general population, you know, with the overweight obesity or over fat group, making up two thirds of the population, you know, we see with diabetics, obviously higher blood sugars, higher insulin, greater risk of things like cognitive decline, dementias, you know, how strong is that connection? And, uh, you know, kind of, where does it fit in with the model here? Blood sugar control, I think, is is critical for a number of, of health outcomes, certainly from an, an associational standpoint in like, you know, there's a separate set of studies where in diabetics, they do sort of very stringent versus more relaxed blood sugar control. That doesn't seem to have much of an effect in itself. But, you know, trying to prevent yourself from getting prediabetes, uh, you know, that's, I think, going to have a significant impact on your long term health. And they've also, they've shown that in individuals with normal blood sugar control versus pre-diabetics versus diabetics, basically as you go up the diabetes scale, your rate of brain atrophy increases. Mm -hmm. So the worse your blood sugar control, you know, the more likely you are to experience cognitive decline over time and the faster that happens. Muscle tissue is your best glucose sink. Mm -hmm. The majority of your blood glucose ends up going into muscle tissue, but you need to create some kind of like pull through, right? You need to have the muscles be doing something to demand that glucose. And we see again in sort of more controlled studies, the more muscle you have and the more active it is, the greater the glucose uptake you have even at rest. So you you create this really nice buffer of blood sugar if you have muscle and you use it. You then think about sort of other aspects. I, I, I don't believe anybody's said, well, if we do resistance training, And we see how much your blood sugar improves. How much does that correlate with cognitive function? I don't think anybody's answered that question. So at this point, we're kind of like, it's a really good idea. We think it's going to be important. But when you look at sort of large observational studies, uh, they've done some where they look at brain. So again, the amount of brain you have in your skull, you know, how much brain have you lost (laughs) relative to the size size of your skull? Um, And then they've also looked at cognitive function in adults based on body composition. Okay. And it seems that, rather than BMI or fat mass or anything like that, which is what we tend to focus on, Mm -hmm. muscle mass is a much better predictor of how much brain you have in your skull and also of cognitive function. So of all the body composition metrics, muscle mass is the best predictor of cognitive function when they've looked at that. Wow, that's that's really something, particularly with the aging populations and how we might screen and and test. I was going to pick your brain on, you know, when we look at testing, you know, fasting glucose, HA1Cs, uh, calculating home IRs versus some of the, 
you know, newer technologies of now people using CGMs and this is, you know, sort of healthy individuals. Mm. And oftentimes what I see in my practice is sort of this over extrapolation of, of what's happening to, to certain meals or, or kind of a hyper focus. Yeah. Um, wondering your, your thoughts there of what kind of tests, you know, you might use and, and your thoughts on the kind of the CGM and uh, let's call them sort of otherwise healthy individuals. Yeah. I think CGMs are super, super interesting. And what we've learned in the last, you know, five or 10 years, you know, particularly the last five years, is that how one individual responds to a carbohydrate-based meal is completely different from the person next to them, mm -hmm. right? The, the idea of glycemic index and glycemic load just be torn up and thrown away because it just doesn't hold true in real world, right? Exactly. So like, you and I could eat exactly the same meal and have vastly different blood glucose responses and it's related to other health metrics and you know when we eat it during the day and whether we've exercised yeah. and like our gut microbiota and our genetics and, and all this kind of stuff so your variability in your blood sugar so like whether you have big spikes um that can be measured in multiple ways one of them is called mage uh, mean amplitude of glycemic excursions i think that does relate to long-term health outcomes we mm -hmm. haven't done any studies where we change that in an individual and we focus just on the the, the blood sugar spikes, and then we, we see long-term improvements. Um, there is one study relevant to that in people with cognitive decline, where it was, but they had diabetes, and they, it was a two-year study looking at dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors, which increase the number of incretins, uh, or like prolong the half-life of incretins, so mm -hmm. things like GLP-1, yeah, GRP, in yeah, in the gut. And they showed that the size of these spikes of blood sugar mage was the best predictor of an individual's cognitive function at baseline. And again, these are older individuals, 60s and 70s. Interesting. And then two years later, the mage had improved, the better your cognitive function had improved. So there was seems to be an association between how much you improve your blood sugar control, particularly those spikes, yeah. relative to cognitive function. So I think that kind of gives us, you know, and, and obviously like they lost weight and all this other kind of stuff as well. So there's it, it's it's not a perfect, For like sure. I can't say it's causal. But that kind of gives us a nice idea that you can change this and it's associated with, with improved outcomes. Um, we also know that like these blood sugar spikes can affect, you know, hunger and satiety and probably, and some studies have shown that they predict uh, risk of diabetes or, you know, the amount of um, atherosclerotic plaque you have in, in your coronary arteries. So like, you know, maybe risk of later heart attacks, yep. but it's all kind of observational. Like what does your blood sugar look like right now? And what does your health look like right yeah. now? So we don't really know, can we intervene and, and change that course? They also generally do it in people who are already diabetic or pre-diabetic mm -hmm. or have some significant health issues. Um, and so I'm not a huge fan of CGMs in a healthy population, uh, because we just don't really know whether that information is that useful or what I see more of is kind of going back to what we talked about genetics, which is essentially you, you create this stress around food, which isn't necessarily warranted. And like, if you have your CGM on continuously for months and months and months, like some people do, what happens is anytime you eat a food that's going to cause a blood sugar spike you is you're going to think <laughs> this is going to cause a blood sugar spike. Yeah. You're going to get stressed about it and it's going to make your blood sugar spike bigger. And there are studies that have shown that as well, that if you uh, tell a diabetic, this food has more sugar in it, they'll get a bigger blood sugar spike, even if there isn't more sugar in that food, right? Mm -hmm. So this, there's an anticipatory and stress related effect that can increase blood sugar. So I, I see a lot of what essentially looks like disordered eating around CGMs in this sort of like health focused group. Yeah. I mean, it seems like the, the athlete or client's disposition is a big trigger in all of this in the sense of if you have an individual who's sort of less likely to, for lack of a better term, overreact to these things, which is what we're describing, yeah. you know, having used this with various athletes over the last five or six years, you know, the successful ones that are picking up sort of these general trends of which, which may seem obvious to a practitioner of, hey, if I add a lot of maple syrup to my oats, I'm going to have this huge excursion and yeah. now I might actually change. Or I ate a bag of Oreos at midnight after a game and wow, I had a huge. Um, but seeing it actually can help them to change behaviors. Yeah. And so in certain individuals, that sort of simple and encapsulated way can, can help. But what you're alluding to, what I, I've seen as well with various individuals is 
once we start going down that other road of trying to tailor everything or getting worried about what the interactions are, mm. this can really get out of control. Yeah. So I think it can be, you know, I think blood sugar levels and blood sugar variability are important for long-term health. Mm -hmm. Like no, no doubt. I think we have enough evidence to, to say that. For sure. And if you're interested in data and you're somebody who responds to data by actually changing behavior, then I think you could, you know, a CGM for two to four weeks. And I think that's probably going to be enough because yeah. most people have a routine and they eat the same eat the food same again, thing, and again yeah. and again. Right. So how many times do I need to see that a midnight, a bag of Oreos at midnight increases my blood sugar? Probably only once. Right. I don't need to yeah. see that for six months in a row. Um, and then bottle of wine a on a Wednesday night. Not yeah. a good idea. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And then you can make a decision about that. So I think a, a short period of time and then making adjustments, absolutely fine. It's just this sort of, you know, longer term yeah. use that I think is unnecessary. But but interestingly, in, in athletes in particular, um, and there's one one CGM company uh, that focuses on this group levels, uh, there, there may be others, but they focus on keeping blood sugar higher, you know, during athletic uh, bouts or performance because the, and again, the evidence isn't great, but it, when they've, put CGM on athletes during some kind of uh, race or something else, particularly in endurance athletes, mm -hmm. higher blood sugars during, um, during exercise are associated with improved performance. So you have to then kind of unpick this. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that high blood sugar is bad and blood sugar spikes are bad. But if I want to perform as an athlete, maybe I need to keep shoveling down the Oreos to keep my blood sugar high during the performance bout. And like, is that better or worse for long-term health? Uh, I don't know. So, so like, there's all these complex things that we don't really fully understand yet. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, circling all the way back to even just straightforward blood tests that someone would get at their doc's office, like the fasting glucose, the HbA1c, like it, are those things that obviously we focus on, you know, for you, how much weight are we putting in those versus obviously a lot of specialty tests now people are paying a lot of money for. Um, mm. What are your thoughts? The more time I've spent doing this, the more I've, just really gone back to the basics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. To be honest, like I've done all these tests, all the urine organic acids tests, bunch of stool tests, whole bunch of fancy metabolomic tests and like expensive blood tests. And I just, I'm not convinced they've ever really helped mm -hmm. that much. Um, so I've done some analyses uh, using population data uh, sets for, like, from the US and the UK. And if I look at like, what is it that predicts mortality or cognitive functional or dementia? HbA1c is a, is a great predictor. Blood pressure is a great predictor. Uh, basic hormone levels are incredibly important, both in men and women. So women are, you know, about two thirds of those with Alzheimer's disease are female. And hormonal status, like during and after the menopausal transition is very important for risk. But, you know, basic estrogen levels, testosterone levels, like this is all stuff you can get on a, on a, on a basic blood panel. Yeah. Uh, you know, red blood cell metrics from a full blood count uh, with differential, you know, lots of stuff that, that sort of is well associated with, with outcomes. So like, that's where I've, I've really ended up. And, you know, maybe if you're in a really niche case and you just can't really figure out what's going on, then sometimes some advanced testing can kind of give you some hypotheses to kind of throw at the wall. And I've, I've done that too, but at sort of a, a large scale, I think, you know, really the basics probably give you most of what you need. Yeah. I've definitely shared that arc as well of, of years ago, really thinking if all these tests, I'm going to get an extra layer. We're going to go deeper down the rabbit hole. And then over time, you end up just coming back to these tried and tested biomarkers that really yeah. are telling you more of the story and they're, more cost effective and we can perhaps run them more frequently in certain individuals and it just ends up being a lot more reliable. So it's a, it's a yeah. challenge, I think even today, obviously, because we can test for so many things. Um, if we kind of zoom back up to 30,000 feet and you know, obviously we've been talking about the brain, which dovetails into things like longevity, which is a growing and growing space. I'm just wondering how you think about things in terms of longevity. We talk, there's groups out there, you know, we're trying to live until 120, um, <laughs> You know, my old neighbor, I think, lived till about 92. He was a farmer across the road. And just one day, you know, that was it for, for Frank. Um, Longevity Arena is something that I'm very interested in, too. Absolutely. And again, I, I think I come across, and maybe I'm a, still a bit of a Luddite, uh, in this arena i think there's there's a lot of promise from a pharmaceutical standpoint you know i'm very interested in nad precursors uh 
rapamycin, I think, is and will be the gold standard once we really sort of see it in some sort of larger studies. You know, metformin potentially, although I, I worry about metformin inhibiting responses to training because there's a couple of studies on that mm. that you get less muscle gain or strength gain and less improvements in VO2 max uh, when you train and you're taking metformin. Uh, so I don't recommend that to people who live an active lifestyle. I also don't think they need it. Mm. Um, but when you sort of like look at the the core factors that seem to be associated with lo- longevity, and, and, I, and I definitely am more of a health span rather than a lifespan person right i you know i'm i'd be happy to be 92 functional and independent and then just i'm i'm done the next day like that's that live long drop dead i think uh that's a mark sisson quote maybe Uh, something like that rather than living till 130 and holding on for dear life yeah exactly and and that you know and i've worked you know as a doctor in in elderly care uh, wards in in London. That was my first one of my first jobs after I graduated from from med school, and we're really good at helping people cling on. But mm-hmm. a, a lot of the time, then maybe not even aware of that. And if they were aware, they probably wouldn't want us to to do that for them. So so I think that's something we can certainly improve in general in in, in healthcare. Absolutely. Um, but when you look at the factors that are uh, associated with long-term brain health, sports performance, longevity, health span, whatever you want to call it, like these core factors just become important again and again. And they are movement quality uh, and like muscle mass in particular, as you get older, is incredibly important. Um, You know, social connection, um, maybe I'm going to add cognitive challenge in there as well, but, you know, diet quality, uh, sleep, some kind of stress uh, mitigation. And with sleep, I also mean like circadian rhythm management, right? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, which is basically just be like, awake when it's light outside and asleep when it's dark outside roughly um yeah rather than up like you're uh, with the tablet or the phone in bed social media all that stuff yeah yeah exactly but so like those core things right movement sleep stress uh social connection diet i think if you nail those things down you know 80 20 or whatever you're already in so much of a, 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 a an improved position compared to the average population. Like just those things, and again, not even optimized or perfected, which I think could actually take you in the other direction if you're hyper focused on that and that's all you think about. Right? That's probably going to give you twenty good years. Like not even hyperbole. So, yes, I, I think all the the drugs are great, and like not everybody, like not everybody's going to do the things that I would recommend in terms of you know putting on some muscle mass and getting good quality sleep and eating a, a nutritious diet. Uh, and, you know, and then if you're trying to decrease the total societal burden, maybe that's when you then need to rely on pharmaceutics. Like I have to acknowledge that's, that's the potential. Sure. But if you nail down the basics, I think the, the, the potential benefits are, are massive. Yeah. I mean, very well put. And the social connection part is really interesting to me on a couple of fronts. Obviously one of them being just how connected we are with, with technology mm-hmm. these days and, the focus on the individual, which is, you know, great up to a sort of certain point of if it's individual all the time, we seem to be losing a little bit more social connection, ironically. Um, Cause we see obviously with some of the data, you know, the more time we're spending in front of screens, the less time with, with individuals out in the community, team sport, all the rest of it. How do we start to balance that part out? If we have a whole, you know, a generation coming up with that more online, more connected, Obviously, there's likely an aspect that we can we can galvanize this, but this idea of being part of a greater whole seems to be a little less of a focus today than it has in perhaps previous generations. Hmm. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a um, broad question there, but it is. It is. I mean, it's it's critically important, and I think um, there's this focus on so again in this sort of like modern westernized societies and i I guess is sort of america the usa has been like the center of this is this this focus on individualism and you know individual freedoms individual success and i think that's kind of pulled us away from what we are as a species which is inherently social and everybody needs to feel wanted to feel loved to feel needed to have purpose and meaning and when we don't have those things, and even if it's just like associational, right, we're not feeling these things, we're not experiencing these things. You know, there's a whole body of literature now that says, well, actually, we can explain this in terms of immune responses, autonomic changes, 
there's this whole bunch of mechanisms that then explain why you experience earlier death, you know, a greater number of chronic diseases. Um, and it's probably because we just like have this basic requirement to be needed and wanted and loved and, and feel useful. And that's essentially what social connection gives us. And there are obviously benefits to, to social media. It allows, you know, for mm. some people, it allows them to get connected, connected yeah. to groups that they otherwise wouldn't. Right. Mm. So if, if you, and you see this a lot in people who start to change their behavior or lifestyle and environment for health related reasons, right. If you go on a specific diet or take up a, a new type of exercise, yeah. right. You might have to find a group online to support you in that because you're, you're, you know, the people around you aren't necessarily that interested. And I think that's, that's great. Tremendous, um, right? Yeah, yeah the, the, there's a lot of benefit there. There are some data that say, though, that sort of like the volume of your connections isn't helpful. It's really the quality of your connections, right? So you can have just three or four really strong social connections, and that's probably much better than being connected to thousands of people on Facebook. So there's a definitely a, a quality is, is more important than quantity. So it probably then doesn't take much. So if you're if you're trying to sort of, you know, balance your long-term risks it probably doesn't take much to then foster some you know just a couple of small strong connections and they probably can be remote right and, mm -hmm. and we saw some of that at the beginning of the pandemic there was this for a short period of time it didn't last but there was a, a short period of time where the population seemed more resilient to the pandemic and the lockdowns than we thought they would be because there was this uptick in reaching out to family members and friends yeah. and communicating over zoom and there was this kind of like we're in this together sort of uh, blitzkrieg mentality Absolutely. and it did it didn't last because we sort of you know counterbalanced by sort of the the stresses but i think you can foster that even online if, if you have to though there's probably some additional benefits from being in person because you know as you get older it gets you out of the house it requires you to keep some mobility and function and that kind of stuff if you're like out there interacting with the world so i think you know just just probably like small concerted efforts are probably enough and Although I, I do like the idea of tying many of these things together, right? So if you yeah. join a dance group, you're dancing, you're interacting socially. So you have the cognitive challenge, the physical challenge, and social interaction all in one place. Yeah. So I think you can kind of like tick off multiple boxes in, in one go if, if you're sort of willing to get out there and try some of these things. I was going to say, when you look at the list, I mean, social connection is sort of embedded in almost the exercise language, music, oh, piece, yeah. even sensory input. So you, yeah, you start getting that amplifying benefit likely, which is which is pretty awesome. Exactly. In terms of, you know, progressions here, you know, when you look down the road in terms of your work or in this area, you know, what are the next things in the next five years that you're excited about? In this arena, what I'd really like to see, and maybe I can contribute to it directly with my own research in, in some ways, but also more broadly, what I want to do is better test the idea that cognitive demand really is this critical factor mm -hmm. in terms of long-term risk of cognitive decline, because I think we have some great evidence for it. But I've, I've also, you know, when I've sent this paper around to people, they've said two things. One, which is that, don't we already know this? Um, and <laughs> come on. And the other is like, how could you be sure? Like, how, how do you know this is true? And it's funny, because both of those things can't be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's probably we're probably somewhere in, in the middle of that. So, you know, some of it probably has to be done in animal models, right? So I'd be interested to know, in the setting of some of these other risk factors, uh, and they could be genetic, environmental exposures, nutrient deficiencies, uh, lack of exercise, lack of social connection. So that creates like a stress response in animals. If we then challenge them cognitively, does do you still get beneficial adaptations even in the face of those stresses? Because then that would still put cognitive challenge at like the primary end, which mm -hmm. is what I think may be true. But So I can test that in the lab and that's something that I hope to do. But then in humans, what we've seen so far is that when we've instituted some of these things, we've often done multiple things at the same time. So the, the finger study is a, is a classic trial where they changed a whole bunch of stuff around cognitive challenges and you know movement and diet. Um, and some of Dale Bredesen's work has done the same. You, you sort of like identify what where some individual can make changes and you do all of them at the same time, mm -hmm. including cognitive challenge with, with brain HQ. But that doesn't tell you where you know, this sort of fits in the in the hierarchy of, of what's most important. Um, so there are some novel like clinical trial methodologies, things like smart trials, systematic multi-assignment randomized trials, where basically you take people and you would randomize them to maybe like four interventions. So maybe one group walks and yeah. one group does 
brain training or you know learns a language and one group improves their diet and one group focuses on their sleep and then you follow them for a period of time and you see how they do and then you randomize them again and then you you stack them up on top of each other and then you can see well where does mm-hmm. you know where does each one affect the other or like where does one person respond to one and not the other and then from that rather than having to do massive trials where you have these you know huge groups each doing something different you know, within the same individuals in a smaller group, you can figure out well, where does cognitive demand really fit into the hierarchy? And I think that's what's needed. And we do propose that kind of idea uh, in the paper as well. So that's kind of where, you know, in this arena, that's what I'd really like to see in the next, you know, five or 10 years. Well, I mean, it's definitely a fascinating read. And I love, particularly for practitioners, docs, and obviously even the clients, athletes, coaches who are aging, you know, flipping the script around, just being stuck into a certain outcome. And now saying, okay, we've got all these potential strategies here, the exercise, language, music, social connection, sensory inputs, like where does that individual want to start? Obviously so much more proactive and to be able to then, you know, as you outlined in the paper, see some of these changes is pretty, uh, pretty tremendous to sort of sum things up for people. Again, if we have a coach or a performance staff member or anyone listening in who's 50, 60, 70, and all of a sudden they feel like, Hey, I've got to do more to help support my brain. Obviously, you've outlined these broad categories. Is there a place that you like to start with patients or clients? So, you know, I'll assume that some of the other basics are taken care of, like you're you're getting a minimal effective dose of movement and that that kind of stuff. You know, in general, I like to focus on easy wins and low-hanging fruit. Uh, Some people don't like the phrase low-hanging fruit because they're like, well, if it's low-hanging, that means you haven't picked it for a reason. You know, (laughs) maybe maybe that's... Overthinking a little bit. (laughs) Right, I think that overthinks it, but... So, so like, you know, if we're thinking about the cognitive demand side, then what is it that you could easily do that you enjoy and that you have time for? And like, that's, that's where I'd start. So, you know, maybe it's even you just like download Duolingo and you try it out and then you realize, oh, you know, I enjoy this, you know, maybe mm-hmm. I'm going to join a language or conversation group and then, then you can start to do some of the other stuff. And so whatever it is, that skill or that thing that you've always wanted to do, but you've never had time for, nice. you know, remember that. You know, for, for this kind of challenge, you're, you're really thinking about things that you can work hard on for like 20 or 30 minutes and then it gets tiring, right? Okay. It's the same thing when we talked earlier about if you, you feel busy all day, you feel like you're challenging your brain, but you're not really, you're just doing the yeah. same stuff again and again. And, and, and that's, not, that's not the same thing. And I, I'd liken that to like junk volume in terms of exercise. Like it's just a whole yeah, bunch of stuff, but you're stuff, never really, but the stimulus yeah. isn't there. <laughs> exactly. You're never driving adaptation. And so... That it's the same with these kinds of things. We, we think that humans, you know, maybe 20 or 30 minutes is really the amount of time you can spend sort of like pushing the boundary of your current skills. And, and, and then you need time to recover and adapt. Uh, so it's that kind of thing. So I would suggest that most people have 20 minutes, three or four times a week to work on a skill that they enjoy. Terrific. And again, so it's the same as exercise. The minimum effective dose isn't that much and it's eminently doable by most people. You eat an elephant one bite at a time. Don't <laughs> don't think that you have to like suddenly go into like this immersive all day, every day course in order to do it. No, just these these little chunks constantly sort of like pushing the boundaries of your current skill level. That's exactly what, what I think people can do. And again, it can be anything that that you'd like to do or anything that you'd enjoy. Awesome. Definitely great tips. And uh, oftentimes comes back to that scheduling, doesn't it, for people of like on Sunday night or in the weekend or Monday morning actually putting those blocks in your in your schedule to actually yeah. do those things because we all know that otherwise the calendar kind of gets swallowed up so amazing tommy listen really appreciate your time we're going to include links to the paper a fascinating read you know where could people stay connected with all your tremendous work and, and keep up with what you're doing the best place is probably instagram at dr tommy wood on instagram and uh you know if uh if i publish a, a new paper or something like that i'll usually i usually post it there awesome it may just be pictures of like my dogs um or what i'm eating to like random if you're interested in a bunch of science and boxes then uh instagram is probably the place to to come fantastic we'll definitely include those in the show notes listen tommy appreciate the time and uh i wanted to pick your brain around concussion but i guess we'll have to uh have to do another one sometime soon yeah sounds great look forward to it 